here in Maine. Yeah, it's getting toasty here too. Hello and welcome to Handgun Radio. I'm your host, Ryan Machad from the wild woods of central Maine, and this is your home for all the news, information, and discussion in the handgunning world. This week, we discuss the commercial history of the 1911 pistol with Daniel Waters. So as always, Handgun Radio is brought to you by the Firearms Radio Network. And please check out the Patriot Patch Company for their awesome patches and other high-quality items. Visit patriotpatch.co for more information. They've had these really cool artist-proof patches, uh, uh, renditions, rather, uh, on uh, on a, like a postcard type of material coming with the latest patch of the month purchase. Um, so make sure you join the Patch of the Month Club. Be sure to check those out. And also shop Amazon using our affiliate link, firearmsradio.tv slash Amazon. And please help support Handgun Radio. Head over to firearmsradio.tv slash pledge and click on HGR. There are a bunch of different pledge levels, and we really appreciate it. So uh, welcome, Daniel. Uh, glad to be back. Got deja vu from last week. Yes, and uh, weird, welcome back. I didn't even expect to have you on this week. I, I guess we didn't communicate that fully. <laughs> but yeah, it's also good to be back. I was hoping to have you on for this episode because, well, this is one that we've gotten multiple emails on that we should mm -hmm. do. So I'm excited. I'm so excited. So I'll start off uh, week in review. Um, we had a very, very terrible situation up here in the state of Maine, something we have not had since 1988 or 89, 88 or 89. Um, we had a law enforcement officer killed by gunfire, um, Corporal Eugene Cole from the Somerset County Sheriff's Department. Um, there was a massive manhunt for the man who killed him, and it is a tragedy for the entire community. Um, for everybody who knew Corporal Cole, they spoke of his commitment to the community policing style um, that he exemplified. Um, being a member of the community and being approachable and being there for people when they needed him and respecting whether he was arresting you or whether he was writing you up for something, he treated you with the utmost respect and dignity that he would expect in return from you. And um, for him to, for him to have experienced what he did is an, absolute tragedy for him and and not only that but for his family and for the community um thankfully the the killer has been brought to justice um he is alive was found in the woods on this past saturday after a, a four-day long manhunt but um we just want to extend our our sincere condolences to the cole family and um to all his his brothers in arms um at the sheriff's department and thank them for their service and there will never there will never really be closure for that sort of loss especially for a guy like him but to, to know that they've done their best and he did his best and that that really means something yeah and i i gotta say i, I think we were talking a little bit before this like oh oh my god the restraint done by the officers of the i was i was not expecting to see him be brought in alive and and judging everything that i've heard of from this guy he, that's that's not something anyone was going to be looking forward to but they've managed to bring him in alive and awesome work on those officers because that 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 was the right thing to do as as much as i may or may not agree with that yeah as much as i understand everybody's just you know, wanting to just you know, see it ended in a certain way. Um, having him brought in alive is going to allow us to, to try to at least answer some questions in terms of why he did this. Hopefully, I, I don't know that for sure, but ho hopefully it will bring some sort of closure to people wondering why this happened. But, so, um, thank you to corporal cole for protecting the community and uh hopefully you know justice continues to be served uh weird what did you do this week uh yeah i've been i've been gone a lot i was uh the uh two weeks ago i was uh, i was up in maine you were missing <clears throat> i was missing i was missing 
Uh, and uh, and then uh, uh, last weekend, I was in uh, Las Vegas and uh, Arizona to go see the Grand Canyon. And uh, let let's just say I did a I, I'm not a gambler, so I, I did a lot of drinking. <laughs> and uh, so I'm going to be talking a lot about about my uh, my experiences in the last like week uh, for the next couple of shows, because there's 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 some good stuff coming. Uh, but uh, but yeah, and then next week I'm going to be at the annual meeting. So again, you're going to have to figure something out you so far you've been doing a pretty darn good job so <laughs> so uh I, I i hope i hope you at least struggle on this next one so i don't get a pink slip in the mail i don't know i got a couple people planned out i i knew better than to not wait till the last minute mm-hmm. right daniel <clears throat> uh, mm, yeah well I, 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 did, I, I didn't message you this morning asking you to come on tonight right oh yeah uh, <laughs> but, I, I, I kind of figured you'd put it off just so I wouldn't be able to write as much show notes. <laughs> <laughs> my my okay. wife asked me this morning after I played my, because I, I was all I was thinking about was my show I had to play last night. And she goes, did you message Daniel? I know you said you wanted to message him about a show. I was like, oh, my God, I never did. Oh, no. Oh, no. And Weird's not around, so I'm screwed. And Daniel was like, yeah, absolutely, I'll do it. And I'm like, oh, thank God. And then a weird goes, do we have a show tonight? I was like, oh, wait, You're what? Around? Yeah. You're around? Oh, no. <laughs> I worried for nothing. Because now we have an awesome show. Yeah. I, I, I would still be worried. Like, come on. I, I, I'm looking at the show notes right now. Like, <laughs> like you're not, you're not going to get this out of me, Ryan. Uh, so, Daniel, uh, how was your week in review? Oh, I, you know, I don't know what I did yesterday, to be honest. Um, I, I did a little bit of a, a deep dive on the Indian Arms uh, 38 pistol and, and tracked that for, um, who did I track that for? Uh, Rob Reed. But uh, other than that, nothing much of interest. Have you been doing much writing or st- where can people access most of your material now? Well, uh, since moving from the gun zone, uh, looserounds.com has been sponsoring me. And so I've got basically everything that was at the gun zone moved over. I probably have it organized a little bit better now. The timeline's now broken up into individual years. So you don't have to keep scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and uh, have a couple well, they're not new articles now. They were new articles last year, but at least there's it's stuff that didn't originally appear on the gun zone. So always come by there or come by the handgun radio discussion group on Facebook. And uh, you know, I don't bite. If you are not in the discussion group, you are missing out on basically everything that we talk about because Daniel shares everything on there. And I wish I could compile it all into a book. Just basically every post and every link and everything. Yeah. It, I don't know, but there's a lot of information there. I get after weird because he's not on there enough. <laughs> yeah, I, I need to get better about that. But I, I've been busy. I've been traveling. All right. So if you've been traveling, do you have a drink segment for us? Or I do do i uh i finally in las vegas i i went to a very very nice cocktail bar that actually happened to be in our hotel was there a buffet uh no well there was there were buffets we went to caesar's palace for buffet and and we had our had our lunch that also that that turned into dinner because yeah we weren't hungry for a while (laughs) Uh, and it's just like the buffet just went on for days. Oh my God. Like it was like four days in food and water to get to the other end of, uh, of the buffet. Uh, but no, this was just a, uh, just, just a, a, a bar on the top of the, uh, the Mandarin Oriental that's on the strip. And, uh, and, uh, yeah, I asked the bartender, I said, can you, can you make, I, I actually was at a, uh, a steakhouse that for, uh, for that, uh, for dinner. So just a couple hours earlier. And I asked to have them make an aviation and the bartender said, I'm sorry, I can't make it. So, so I, I went with a martini and, uh, uh, and so I, uh, my wife said, you know what? 
I bet you this bar has got it. Why don't you go in and have a make this, whatever the heck this drink is you're talking about? Cause probably a lot of you listening are probably just, just like my wife of the, I don't even know what language you're talking. <laughs> and so I went in and I ordered an aviation and the bartender went, Oh, how, you know, how do you like it? I said, I've never had one. And, uh, and so he said, Oh, should I, should I make it my way or, you know, my way or, or the classic way? And I said, let's have the classic way if you can make it. So the, the reason why this recipe has kind of been like this, this drink's been a kind of a Holy grail for me is so it's a pre prohibition cocktail. That's that gives it some street cred. It's also in the Savoy cocktail book, which is kind of the craft cocktail Bible. So this is one of those drinks that's there. It's, it's, it's right there in the varsity level. But what it is, is it's two ounces of gin, three quarter ounces of lemon juice, a half ounce of Luxardo, and here's the kicker, a quarter ounce of creme de violet. And that's a violet flavored liqueur. And it, I can't find it anywhere. Like, I just, I, everywhere I look, they don't have it. It's, it's very, very hard to come by. I don't even know what it costs. Um, but had it really good. Bartender says, would you like, and then I flagged him and I said, you know what? I'll, I'll have another make, make it your way. And so here's, here's what I'm drinking right now. This is a, I don't know exactly the ratios he made it, but I adjust the ratios a little bit. And I think this is just about perfect for my palate. Two ounces of gin, one ounce of lemon juice, half ounce of Luxardo and a quarter ounce of Chambord, which is a raspberry liqueur. It's ba- It's got a French name. It's based on a French liqueur, but it's actually hundred percent American made. I was actually surprised at that. Uh, and you can find this at any reasonably stocked liquor store and it's not very expensive. And this is, it's better than the, 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 the creme de violet one. Like that's the creme de violet is good. The Chambord is a little bit better in my opinion. It's it's the, the bartender was right. And so a lot of these, you know, crazy craft cocktails I've been talking about are kind of inaccessible to, to, to you guys that aren't de- you know, deep in the weeds. Like I am this one, you can go down to your corner liquor store. And so long as they have a reasonable stocking of liquor, you can make, you can get this cocktail for, and make a whole ton of them for super duper short money. Like I'm using new Amsterdam gin, which is $9 for a fifth and it's everywhere. Lemon, you you got a lemon go buy it go to your store buy a lemon go buy one of those plastic lemons i'm not going to judge you uh luxardo used to be rare but now just about everyone has it like i i I rarely don't see it at a liquor store anymore um and uh same with the chambord it's it's reasonably priced and for the luxardo and the chambord buy the smallest bottle you got because you're just going to be using a little bit just to flavor the drink and so it's a really accessible, really, really good cocktail. And it's very, very balanced. So I think a lot of people will be surprised at how good it is. Before we head into the main topic, you'll enjoy this weird. Um, I, I played a new bar this weekend. Mm-hmm. Um, one of my first gigs there. And uh, there was a, a new bartender. And so I go up to order my drink and I said, yeah, I'd like a, a Jim Beam neat. And she goes, Jim, Jim Beam with what? And I said, Jim Beam neat. With oh, what? No. And I said, neat. She goes, what do you mean neat? And I was like, just pour Jim Beam in a glass. Oh, what side of the bar are you on? And <laughs> Oh, that's so Bush League. She goes, oh, okay. And I looked at somebody. I'm like, I- I'd hate to see what she would do if I said Jim Beam on the rocks. She probably would figure that one out. <laughs> but the, but was there yeah. chicken wire in front of the stage at this bar? No, not at this bar. It was not one of those. Did you play Give Me Some Lovin'? <laughs> God, no. It was not a Blues Brothers bar. Yeah. <laughs> do, do, you, do you play Give Me Some Lovin'? That's a good song. I should. I should. But uh, anyway, yeah, I thought you'd find that funny. That, that is hilarious. And anyway, sad. <laughs> so uh, with that, we'll head into the main topic, the M1911 extravaganza. So, uh, Daniel, we had requests for this. Um, people, people request your presence. Huh? Um, basically we talked before when we talked about the 1911 before, wasn't it like the custom stuff? Yeah. Yeah. That was uh, about a year ago, I think. Right. So perfect. So a year ago. So we're going to talk about the commercial stuff. So for the first 60 to 70% of it, it was coal, right? Yep. That was pretty much it uh, until you get to the seventies. Uh, 
you know, despite the name, you know, model of 1911, you don't really see any production until 1912. And there's, Colt actually gets a few uh, commercial government models out during that year. Other than Colt, really, most people's experience with the 1911s is probably going to be through surplus pistols sold through the NRA, uh, the Director of Civilian Marksmanship, or basically stuff that walked off uh, from World War One or World War Two. I, I came across a figure here that uh, during World War One, something like nearly 170,000 1911 were were reported lost, destroyed, or missing. And that's Quote, like, unquote, lost. Yeah. And that's that's more than a quarter of the pistols that were made. <laughs> so you can only imagine how many walked off during World War II or in Korea, Vietnam, et cetera. Um, well, you definitely, you hear, you hear a lot of stories about like guys, you know, in I I I know I remember reading a specific story on uh, on a uh, on an enlisted man who had uh, killed a German officer in World War II. And he co he collected his uh, his uh, his Luger, his uh, PO8, and uh, and another officer you know found out he had one and it traded it he traded his uh, 1911 A1 for the Luger and the guy was talking about oh yeah no that was such a good trade on my behalf but I I, I can't imagine that that uh, that that trade it was uh, was 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 kosher with the uh, with U.S. government property. But yeah. couldn't back in those days, couldn't the uh, couldn't the officers when they when they left the service buy their uh, buy their sidearm? Uh, sometimes, yes, I, I believe. It, basically, your either your commanding officer could sign off on it on, on certain occasions, or like with general officers, general officers could buy their their issue pistol, um, which was usually the nineteen oh three, right? Generally, the nineteen oh three. Sometimes the 1911, um, certainly the M15 from the 70s, they could. I don't know if they can do that with the general officer's uh, version of the M9. And I can only imagine what the general officer's version of the M18 is going to look like. <laughs> <laughs> like, how, how fancy can you get that pistol? But uh, at any rate, yeah, I mean, it's it's pretty common knowledge that the pistols walked off, you know, grew legs, five-finger discount. Uh, but yeah, uh, despite all the companies that were called in to make the pistol uh, during World War One and World War Two, you know, they they honored, you know, they they weren't going to step on Colt's toes. So so let's say I'm a I'm a just a average person in 1920 Chicago, and I want to buy a 1911 for protection. What what are my options, Colt? Colt. Yeah, it's basically Colt or, you know, somebody just happened to have one of the Remington UMC uh, pistols or one of the spring, actual Springfield Armory pistols, which that was the U.S. Army arsenal, not, not, not the current company. There's no relation between the two. Now, was Colt advertising them commercially at this time? Oh, yeah. So did they start right when they got the, the, the military contract, or was that a few years after? No, they start building uh, government models for the commercial market in 1912. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. They definitely I mean, they just have so many different eras of, okay, we're doing this thing, and then we're doing this thing, and and they're listed in the show notes. So everybody, if you're listening to this episode, you need to go check out the show notes because every time Daniel does an episode, his show notes are fantastic. And so really besides the, the government model, the first other commercial pistol you, you see is the super 38 in 1929. That's what of course we now call the 38 super. Uh, essentially, Colts 1902 and 1903 uh, pistols and 38 ACP, they weren't spectacular sellers, but they were steady sellers. And eventually, of course, the tooling wore out on those. And someone at the factory figured, well, let's just adapt our government model for that cartridge. And one of the myths is that they, they had planned out ahead of time to load the round hot when they introduced it, but evidently that hotter 38 super ammo didn't actually show up for a couple years 
beyond the introduction of the Super 38. You've got uh, 1931, you have the Colt Ace, that's your first 22 version of the government model. The original Ace was straight blowback, uh, very, very light slide. Uh, one of the really odd features is that there's a roller on the firing pin stop to try to reduce the friction of the slide so it could operate. A year later, you have the, the first national match pistols, which I discussed in, in the competition episode. That's popular enough that they do a 38 super version of it, the super match. Going further, you've got the service model ACE, and that's the first one that has Mel Johnson's, or, or uh, not, uh, not Mel Johnson, uh, Carbine Williams uh, floating chamber. That's Actually, Daniel, I'm going to interrupt you real quick on this since we're talking about the, the the introduction of the 38 super in the early days what where did the 38 super really come from i you know i've heard i've heard some stuff that like it was super popular in like law enforcement during the prohibition era but i is is that have you found corroborating evidence of that well you know again you didn't really have a lot of options for a powerful pistol you know it's and again, the the original 38 ACP from uh, the 1900 trial army trial pistols, the the 1902 military, the 1902 sporting, the 1902 or 1903 pocket hammer. Again, they they had they had a following. They weren't super, you know, high production numbers, but they produced enough, and there was enough demand that Colt decided to just put it in put it in a new pistol or at least a pistol that they could still make yeah but so what was it but it was it, it was mostly for it being because there wasn't competition back then so because that's nowadays the the 38 super is is almost always in a gamer gun um but it was it was it was definitely more of the it, this is this is kind of the magnum pistol round of its era Certainly, once they started making hotter loads for it, yeah, yeah. I mean, basically. And when, when did you say the the hot, the hot the hotter loads started showing up? I want to say it was a, a couple of years after the introduction of the Super Thirty Eight. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's kind of one of the myths that you know the the two were designed together, but. Yep. Cause I know I've, I've read a ton of stories and they're almost verbatim. So I, I suspect they're, they're quoting this, this, the, like the same source that, that the, the, the police officers that were, and, 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 and federal and, and the G men that were chasing the, you know, the moonshiners and the rum runners and the, and, and the, uh, you know, people like the, the Dillinger gang and stuff like that were all they all carried 38 supers because that stuff would punch through the audio bodies of those cars. And of course, as we know, those cars weighed like a million pounds back then. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> got, yeah. got two miles to the gallon. Well, and again, velocity, particularly with metal you know, velocity definitely helps you with penetration. Mm -hmm. And again, there weren't a whole lot of other high velocity options unless you had like a American Eagle Luger, or you know, you'd somehow picked up a Mauser broom handle or something. Yeah, they also had a. Ton, there was also a ton of uh, of very crude uh, ballistic armor back then. But that I, I I would imagine, judging from what I've seen on that of the you know essentially a lot of it was just like was cotton, just just really tightly woven cotton, and those that armor I got to imagine would actually make short work of a. They would that would stop a forty five ACP just with that big fat round nose bullet that that thing's going to just get mashed up and, and dump all its energy in, into, into the cotton, but something like a 38 super probably would have a much better chance. Yeah. And again, it's, it's, it's hard to kind of track some of these things down as far as the veracity, but uh, I know Julian Hatcher's uh, review of the pistol for once it was American rifleman. He definitely mentioned you know, the, the penetrating abilities and sort of the splash 
it made in uh, an artificial media. Also, I, I think we talked about it in a previous show, but the um, there is a famous uh, uh, 1911 that uh, that was in uh, that had an extended magazine and a uh, a uh, a Thompson uh, submachine gun foregrip onto it and, a, and an auto sear. Yeah, and that was that was that was carried by somebody in the Dillinger gang. I don't I don't know if it was Dillinger himself. Lutman guns. Yeah. What's that? Yeah, exactly. And that that gun was in 38 Super. Yeah, uh what's say that was Pretty Boy Floyd's. Uh, yeah, I think I think you're right on that one. And uh there was the massacre at uh what's a Union Station in Kansas City of federal agents. And so that was also one of the incidents that uh, caused the FBI to get permission to be armed. But so speaking after the war here this this is kind of the era that i don't really have a lot of information about and, and i really was interested in for this episode from like 1950 to 1970 what's going on with the 1911 with colt and are there any other manufacturers looking into this system no i mean that's that's basically it i mean it, it, people were trying not to step on other people's territory it's not like today. No, it's not like today. Um, I mean, Smith and Wesson prototyped a, a 45 auto back around 62 based on their model 52. And, you know, they wouldn't release a 45 auto until the mid eighties with the 645. I mean, a lot of people say, well, they didn't want to put Colt's name on their pistol. A lot of that was also, we don't want to step on, you know, other people's territory. Uh, well, they, well, they had they had they had guns chambered in Luger pl- for 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 a while, so that's not. Uh, well, that's, it's it's, it's not all- not to say the Colt name, but I, I guess I guess that, that that's not as it's not quite a, as a, a bitter rivalry, right? And you know, they they would step on each other's toes when there was actual competition involved. I mean, as far as contracts, you know, if the government comes sniffing around, sure. You know, we'll chamber whatever you want. Or law enforcement agency comes around, yeah, we'll chamber that for what you want. But, uh, you know, if, if there wasn't money on the line, you know, they weren't going to go out of their way to, you know, poke their competitor in the ribs. So, really, the, the first variation you get is in 1950 with the Colt Commander. And that's the, what we'd call today the lightweight commander, which is one of the first. Uh, pistols made with aluminum, with an aluminum alloy frame, at least in the U.S. Uh, they went so far as to lighten the slide. Uh, they made the they even made the mainspring housing out of aluminum, just to try to get it as light as possible. And again, that that tracks back to our JSAP, my my very first episode with handgun radio. So. And, and and to to clarify to everyone that that was that original Colt Commander lightweight Commander, but that was just the standard Commander. The Combat Commander was the all stainless gun, uh, all steel, the, yeah, the all, all steel. Uh, and the uh, but that was in nine by nineteen. That was in nine millimeter Luger. That that was the original chambering. So that came actually to me. it was. Uh, they didn't chamber it in nine by nineteen. Oh, at is, least is commercially. True? At least commercially, they they did for the government, but commercially they didn't do it till like nineteen fifty one. Yep. But so it was originally in in forty five ACP. It was in forty five, and it was in thirty eight super. Okay, I I I did not know that. I had always read that the first uh, the first chamberings of the commander was in uh, nine by nineteen. I yeah. I personally prefer it in forty five. It's fun in thirty eight super too. I, I had a chance to, to shoot one of the let's say it was a nineteen fifties, like mid fifties, and yeah, that was pretty sweet. But uh, and really, you don't see Colt doing anything else until they reintroduce the national match, which we you know call the Gold Cup today. And again, we discussed a lot of this in the competition episode, so you can go back and, and look at those notes. Uh, the prototype for hmm? well, then Colt gets gets competition to tonics. Well, yeah, we're 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 getting there. I mean, it's it, since. It's, since we had mentioned the, the combat commander that came at 71 
there have been prototypes for the government again in, in 69. Now you see the Series 70 first introduced in 71. And really the Series 70, the only real distinguishing feature of, of that pistol from the earlier models was the collet bushing, what they called the accurizer bushing. And that was a controversial feature because at least people that didn't disassemble their pistols by the manual uh, had a habit of breaking the fingers or at least stressing the fingers on the collet bushing. And they'd break at very inopportune times if you shot them a decent amount. And that would just tie the whole pistol up. But yeah, you don't see the government model in 9 by 19 commercially until 72. Well, Daytonics comes rolling around. You see the first press mentions of them around 74, but they certainly weren't ready for production yet. And only the first production model will showed up about 76. And besides being one of the, the first commercial super compact 1911s, that's also where you see like the first bull barrel 1911. Um, but yeah, Daytonics introduced a lot of stuff that they don't necessarily get recognized for. But going on to the next year, you've got the AMT Hardballer, which is one of your first stainless steel. Actually, just to, I got I got to interrupt you again, Daniel. Here is the so is the I just did a quick search because I I don't know my uh, my uh, Daytonics models very mm -hmm. well. Is the the Combat Master is that is the uh, that's the subcompact? Yeah, that's the itty bitty one. Yeah, it's like six shot magazine. Uh, yeah, no, it, it appears to yeah. be yeah the uh, essentially the uh, well officer ACP size four it's four smaller. inch barrel. They, uh, yeah, it's smaller. They had one of those at Julia's at the final auction. I got to handle it. That thing is tiny. Yep. Yeah, it's it's basically you know your pinky kind of hangs off of that one. Yep. The only thing the only thing close to the Combat Master in production today would be like the Wilson Combat Sentinel. Uh, Sentinel is actually a little bit bigger than the Combat Master. That Combat Master felt like the size of my CM9. Yeah, they're they're tiny. They're they're you know right in this J frame, you know, territory as far as overall. But so that was that was the first thing because I mean I know Teutonics made full size guns as well. So that, but the first thing they dove into was was the sub the subcompacts. Yeah. Well, that's where that's where they figured the market was because. Yep. Well, were, it, go ahead, Daniel. There, there were custom gunsmiths that were doing stuff like that, but you know you basically had to chop up the slide and the frame and weld it back together, and maybe you could find springs that would work and maybe not. And so, at least with a production model, you start having you know, a certain amount of aftermarket support. And it, it, the funny thing is, these two brands are two like, you know, they're not like huge brands like Colt or Smith & Wesson, but you see the AMT Hardballer pop up in the video game Hitman. That's the first place that I heard of it when I was a young kid. Oh, no, 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 the Terminator. The, the Terminator, oh, Terminator was the first place I ever saw an AMT Hardballer. Well, I saw it in Hitman. but uh, then... that, that was the first time I really recognized it for what it was, and then when I rewatched Terminator, I went, oh, yeah, that that's the one. The Detonics Combat Master, or Score Master, I don't know which it was, was carried by Tackleberry yep. in Police Academy. And also by uh, Tom Selleck in, uh, uh, what was it, Runaway? What was the, the one with him, him against Gene Simmons? Yeah, uh, uh, I want to say that he had a score, uh, Service Master in that one. Actually, there are a lot of Detonics in that movie. Uh, I want to say there's there's a combat master that has a like a barrel extension on it, and that shows up like in Terminator Two, uh, in the scene where they're blowing up Cyberdyne. And there's so many. I mean, that's a, it's a fairly common gun in the movies in that time period. According to uh, IMFDB, the the uh, Detonics used by Tom Selleck was a uh, Detonic score master. Hmm which looks like it's got a six inch barrel on it, but I might be wrong. 
and and it was it and and you're right daniel that this that exact same gun was the one used by lyndall hamilton in uh, terminator 2 yeah so well again prop masters you know they take what they can get you know they oh yeah, oh, yeah. whatever looks interesting yeah, I mean, the, the or not even that. I mean, the, the 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 Beretta 92 that was used in Lethal Weapon was also the Beretta 92 used in Die Hard. They just they just bounced around a lot. Yeah, they but beat it, the hell out of it too. Oh, that gun is beat to <laughs> hell, and in a good way. I love I love guns that have honest wear. So, go ahead. So moving on, basically, you have. You have these couple companies coming on. Um, it looks like Colt was reintroducing the Service Ace in 1978. Yeah, I mean they they they'd had the conversion kits on the market, but I think the real reason they they reintroduced the Service Ace was because they were getting rid of the the Woodsman family because it, it was really even their post uh, World War II tooling. Was getting worn out and it was just no longer viable a viable pistol to produce so they wanted a 22 semi-auto in their line but of course the the woodsman wasn't as popular for target use as it was before the war because again there's lots of competition from from ruger from high standard etc so i think they just figured well you know we can use the same frames as our as our government models and you know, put the different slide on it. And, you know, we've got that part of the market covered. No one, no one's really going to expect it to be a target pistol. So, yeah, we'll, we'll just fill that slot. Of course, that's also when the same year you see Crown City Arms try to introduce uh, complete pistols, uh, MS Safari, uh, what we call Safari Arms comes on the market. That's the one that has the uh, finger groove on the front strap. Also one of the first uh, commercial 1911s to have a hook trigger guard. They looked very trick for that era. Uh, nowadays, you kind of look at it like, oh, that's kind of crude, but eh, they were kind of neat at the time. Crown City Arms, they'd, they'd started off uh, like Essex, basically as being uh, a supplier of frames and and other parts uh, doing investment casting. Fortunately, you know, any process can be done well and it can be done poorly. And Crown City leaned more to the, towards the poorly part uh, side of the equation. Uh, next year, you, you have the Vega, which is another stainless steel pistol. Looks a lot like uh, the Colt National Match Slides. It's also the same year you have the AMT Hardballer long slide introduced with a seven inch barrel. Which is the one in Terminator. Just, in Terminator. just get a dive back in on that one. 25 long slide with laser sighting. Um, but your Arnold impersonation is fantastic. <laughs> Thank you for doing that. Yeah. Somebody had to do it, right? <laughs> That's so great. But again, you start seeing the interest in stainless steel. Uh, the Kunin is announced in 1980, although they don't really get in production for several years. Uh, I only mention that just because it's it's very 1911-esque. I mean, most of the parts... Especially the earlier ones. The, the, the Kunin that's around right now is looks like a 1911, but there's a lot of stuff that isn't 1911 in it. The first generation Kunins were a lot more 1911, where they had... The current ones, I think they've got a tilting trigger and a uh, they use they're using a, a Browning linkless system, and I'm sure there's a bunch of other stuff that's that's different. But just right off the right off the bat, just me looking at it, you can quickly see where they're different from a a, a standard 1911. The original one had the the sliding trigger and the uh, and, and a uh, swing link. Yeah, that's what they would call the Model A today, mm -hmm. but they're very low production of the Model A. Uh, 81, you've got the ODI, ODI Viking, which was an attempt to make a, a commercial production version of the Seacamp double action conversion for the 1911. Uh, the AMT Skipper, that's just basically AMT's version of a commander 
back then. MS Safari, their line expands to, to basically any sort of competition variation of the 1911 you could think of. Bullseye, uh, they had bowling pin models, uh, which is sort of your, your early comp gun. At one point they had a silhouette model long slide that was like 10 inches long, something ridiculous. Um, who approved the name AMT Skipper? Because all I can think of is like the AMT Gilligan being the 22 <laughs> LR training model. Little buddy! Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think that was kind of a, a play off of Commander. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. Um, Michigan Armament, they, they're also trying to build competition pistols that resemble the custom guns of the era, you know, two tone. Blue slide over stainless frame, uh, lots of feet, lots of features like the, ex the extended aluminum trigger, uh, extended safeties, better sights than, than what you would get on Colt for another couple of years. Uh, 82 is a, a pretty big year. That's when you have auto ordnance introduced their 1911s. Uh, Vega goes away and uh, Randall comes in. And supposedly Randall was one of the first to actually make a stainless steel gun that wouldn't necessarily gall, which was a big issue with the AMTs and, and some of the aftermarket stainless parts that had been made, is that if you didn't lubricate them right, they just, the slide and frame would either kind of weld themselves together or tear themselves apart against each other. Uh, there's the Armnex Tri-Fire, which is, it's, that's an odd hybrid pistol. Uh, the, the name Tri-Fire was because you could supposedly uh, convert it from 45 to 38 Super to 9 millimeter uh, very easily. Had a lot of Smith & Wesson features. I wouldn't be shocked that their uh, slide-mounted safety and their ejector was straight off of the Smith & Wesson. But... That was, that was kind of a, their production was spotty. They, they, had, they had issues. Uh, you have one of the first really hot uh, Wildcats for the 1911, the 451 Detonics Magnum, which is basically in, in 45 super territory today, but it actually used a longer case. And so it, you either had to buy the cases from Detonics or trim down like a 45 Win Mag or Heaven forbid you had to trim down rifle brass <laughs> to make it. It was very hot, and it was really too hot for the Daytonics pistols being made at the time. They just weren't up to it. You also, uh, North American Manufacturing had announced their 45 Win Mag pistol, which was basically the future LAR Grizzly, which again, is, it's basically a stretched 1911. Well, 83 is the year you've got the, the Series 80 uh, pistols coming out from Colt. Uh, really, the first Series 80, the only difference between that and the Series 70 was the firing pin safety. That was a major feature. They hadn't yet started putting on better sights. They hadn't yet uh, gotten rid of the accurizer collet bushing. So at least now you know when they did it. Uh, but you also see Colt starting to recognize that competition shooters want something more than what they've been putting out. So you have the, what they called at the time the combat grade, which had higher sights, Packmeyer grips straight from the factory, um, flat mainspring housing, long trigger. It's not really a custom pistol, but it was better than what Colt was putting out at least in their standard pistols. It's also when you see the, the Daytonic Score Master, again, full barrel, uh, full-size pistol aimed mainly at the competition market. Uh, Caspian Arms is coming online then. At the time, they're not making stuff for the general public, but they're making stuff for folks like Daytonics and other smaller manufacturers. Well, 84, you get, uh, Randall makes what they call the Curtis LeMay four-star pistol. Evidently, the owner of Randall was a friend of, 
I'm General Curtis LeMay of the Air Force, used to be Chief of Staff. Um, and this, this pistol was basically a copy of the Air Force's own custom compact pistols that they'd made for their Office of Strategic Intelligence officers. A very tiny grip with sort of like a commander link slide. It might even consider it sort of a proto type of what we now call a concealed carry officer's model, a CCO. But Randall also did something very different. They made a mirror image, uh, basically mirror image models of their pistols for, for left-hand use. But some some safety is flipped to the opposite side, ejection ports is flipped to the opposite side, et cetera. Well, next year, 85, you've got Colt introducing the officer's ACP. They also introduced their first stainless steel government model which basically starts knocking out all the little small manufacturers, previous manufacturers that were you know, trying to do stainless pistols. Uh, Springfield Armory comes in, the Illinois version of Springfield Armory, and they're bringing in their rebranded, rebranded pistols from Imbel of Brazil. And that really starts putting a hurt on Colt because, you know, with, with other manufacturers called go, well, you know, their investment casts, they're not as good as our forgings. Well, the Brazilian pistols, they were they were forged pistols. Uh, essentially, Colt had helped set up that plant. Yeah, they were they, they were they were licensed copies. At one time, yeah, they were uh, at least licensed copies when Brazil yeah. had adopted them. Uh, it's also when you see the Kunin Model B first show up. Um, you also have uh, weird little accessory mods for the 1911, like the Pacmar Dominator, uh, which turns the 1911 frame into a single shot bolt action pistol. Matter of fact, one of the friends of Handgun Radio, uh, the fellow that, that did your Model 36. Oh, uh, Chris Rose, uh, Bayside Custom. Yeah. Uh, he's he's done a lot of Pacmar Dominator. Yeah, he loves Pretty those things. <laughs> yeah. Odd little pistol. And that, that one, if, since we're talking movies, that one makes an appearance in, uh, in the, uh, uh, Leon, the professional he's Leon's got one. He never uses it, but it's, it, it's in his gun box. So the next year you've got the combat elite, which is again, another, another Colt sop at, at trying to look like a custom pistol. that was two-toned blued over stainless. Uh, you have the Detonic Service Master, which is their commander-sized pistol. Again, bull barrel. Uh, Springfield Armory teases an officer's uh, ACP clone, but they never bring it out. And Randall goes out of business, but it's replaced by Falcon. And evidently, the folks behind both companies were, were the same folks. Uh, one was like the father, and the other one was the son. And so... It's like when, when one company folded, the other started the new company under a different name and brought in a lot of the old employees. Uh, 87s, when you see the Delta Elite in 10 millimeter, uh, Springfield Armory imports the uh, Peter Stahl multi-caliber conversion, which they call the Omega. Uh, Safari Arms goes out of business and Olympic Arms buys them up. Uh, LAR brings out long slide versions of the Grizzly. Start seeing more competition in the 80s. Uh, Colt drops the call at bushing. Pair ordnance comes out with their high capacity frame kits. Uh, There's a big thing for people to, to understand too. Like nowadays, people you know have an, uh, their own idea of the gun industry and and sales and how they happen. Back in the day, it was completely different. You didn't have the internet. You didn't have you know, I mean, in the early 90s, you had message boards and stuff, but I mean, you didn't have the the avenues today that you have to find the firearms that you want. Yeah, it's, it's basically gun magazines or nothing. You know, like shotgun news. Yeah. Or, you know, whatever's advertised in guns and ammo or, you know, American handgunner, et cetera. Uh, the Springfield Armory Defender in that era, that was their attempt at sort of doing a, a competition 
uh, kind of sort of competition pistol. It was already outdated by that point. I, I really think they were inspired by the Gunsight um, GSP, Gunsight Surface Pistol, that Cooper had been promoting very heavily at the time. But and basically, it had better sights, uh, bobbed hammer, beveled magazine well. Um, let's say it had a match trigger and uh, extended thumb safety. They also come out with a commander model at the time. Uh, which they eventually have to change the name for because Colt has the trademark for that. Uh, Daytonics comes out with their Janus Scoremaster, which is, you can either set it up as a five inch gun or uh, turn it into a comp gun or a pin gun and move the front side out to the body of the comp. Uh, that's probably what you saw in uh, Runaway, I think, the one that looks like a long slide. Uh, Safari Arms brings back the Enforcer and Mashmaster from Safari Arms. You've got Auto Ordnance doing a weird, weird hybrid of uh, basically an officer's ACP length slide and barrel on top of a government model frame. And then in 1989, you've got the Double Beagle. Yeah, the Double Beagle. Uh, and so I, I, I hate the, everybody hates that gun, but I kind of love that gun. I've handled one, and I'm kind of like, I hate it so much that I like it. <laughs> I mean, did I ever send you the picture of the one that uh, Chuck Warner did? No. Uh, he actually made one into a comp gun for Lane Simpson of Shooting Times. I would love to see that. <laughs> and the, the neatest part was he actually he reworked the back strap to have a, an actual beaver tail. And... Uh, Put like an SNA uh, magwell on it, welded up a whole new trigger guard to reshape it, actually made it look better and kind of raised it a little bit. It really does not feel that bad in the hand. Yeah, part of the part of the issue with the, with the double eagle is it was just kind of a uh, well, yeah, yeah, that was during the strike. <laughs> yeah, it, it was during the strike years. It was sort of a kind of a, a cheap copy of the C Camp design. And they, were, they were trying to you know, avoid stepping on, on. Really, I think the patent should have just been expiring around that time. But I mean, you take the grips off and just parts fall off the gun, or at least on the first edition that they did. Uh, let's see. Just keep going here. Got the Springfield Armory 19, uh, 90s edition, which is their first attempt to pass the Defender to kind of try to spiff up their guns, at least more so than what Colt had. Uh, Pair of Ordnance starts putting out their, their production guns. Uh, the Skipper comes back, now in 40. Uh, actually, strangely enough, the Skipper is a CCO or at least at that time of production. Uh, same went for the Springfield Armory Compact. Uh, you know, sort of a commander link slide over an officer's frame. So let's see, coming years. Oh. I mean, you have all these various boutique manufacturers that yeah. I heard about in the early 90s, like STI and SVI. and Yeah. And again, we go over that in the competition episode quite a bit. And where does Kimber come into it? Well, Kimber comes in around 95. Uh, basically, they hired on Chip McCormick, uh, the competition shooter, as a consultant. And they went around to a bunch of custom gunsmiths soliciting uh, sample models. And some blew them off, others basically sent them free guns and they looked at the features and they tried to basically copy what a custom single stack 1911 looked like, but with less expensive parts. Uh, I mean, MIM parts have been used in the firearms industry since basically the early eighties and the, like the Bryn 10, uh, Remington was using it in 
and some of its uh, long guns. But Kimber was really the first to spread it out, at least in a, in a pistol where people now knew the term metal injection molding. And it, it really appears like a lot of folks that had sent in the sample pistols suddenly got access to the Kimber parts. And so like the original Wilson 1996s, those are essentially a combination of, of Kimber slides and frames and some other parts with, with Wilson's custom line parts. Uh, another one was, was Nowlin, uh, let's say d &J Custom. And the interesting thing was Kimber at the time was getting their slide and frame forgings from Smith & Wesson, which I don't think a lot of people appreciate. Uh, you know, that how certain, co certain companies like Smith & Wesson made the explosion or proliferation of all these different makers possible. Now, about what time do you see people like uh, Les Bayer and Wilson? Well, Bayer comes comes online about 93. And a, a lot of that, I think, came from, uh, first of all, you know, a lot of the gunsmiths were getting harassed over back taxes. Uh, ATF was taking a very liberal view or a very narrow view, I'm sorry, a yeah, very narrow view of, of what manufacturing meant. So, you know, if you're filing on parts, if you're fitting parts, uh, they call it manufacturing, even though, you know, your pistol may have come from somebody else. If, if you're taking someone else's manufactured pistol and you're making modifications to it and then selling it, they still want the taxes from you for manufacturing. And so, you know, a lot of these gunsmiths are saying, well, if we're going to be paying these taxes, let's just quit messing around on rebuilding other people's guns and just, you know, source the parts out from somebody and make our own with our own name on it. And so Bear, Les Bear was one of the first to do that. Uh, he came, he started doing it about 93. Uh, Wilson came online. Let's say he announced it in 96, but didn't actually have any until 97. But yeah, that's when you really, really start seeing uh, what were formerly custom shops turning into production customs. Well, I mean, you move into the 2000s, you have companies like Rock Island Armory, Taurus has their PT-1911, um, US, uh, US Firearms, um, had their M1910 and M1911. They went out of business shortly thereafter and then did the zip gun. Uh. <laughs> bizarre, bizarre choice. Um, Springfield Armory has always done decent 1911s from what I've heard. And then Colt has kind of reintroduced a bunch of different 1911s in 2008 and, and on. So, um, Colt's kind of gotten back into it, but then we also have companies like Cabot as well. Yeah, and again, I think a lot of this comes from CNC machinery becoming, you know, more accessible. Uh, you also have a lot of sources for either the raw parts or complete pistols. A lot of people are rebranding other people's pistols. Uh, example would be Bull Limited's uh, pistols. Uh, at different times, Springfield was going to represent them. EEA was going to represent them. Uh, Char Charles Daly was going to represent them. <laughs> and right now, they make the Magnum Research pistols. Uh, you also have uh, Dasan out of South Korea, who they basically, at least starting in around 1912 or so, or not 1912, 2012. Uh, their major customers were Remington, Sig Sauer, and Springfield Armory. Between those three companies, that was like 60 to 70% of their U.S. business right there. And so Dasan can do anything from raw forgings to castings, 80% um, frames to just complete essentially everything you need to build the gun. 
uh, besides the companies I mentioned, I think they're they're also supplying like um, is it uh, Rimsport uh, 1911 builder for their 80% frames. Uh, the double star guns were essentially disarmed guns. Uh, Arms Corps of the Philippines. So many of these one these little no name ones that you see here. They're basically Arms Corps pistols or their their Philippine competitor um, sporting arms manufacturer or yeah, I think it's sporting arms manufacturer, Sam. But you look in twenty eleven, like you have listed here, you have Ruger gets into the nineteen eleven business, Colt has the new agent DAO. You have the Springfield Army Range Officer, all these different Rock Island guns, and many others. Well, again, a lot of people were getting, you know, trying to do like a, a 1100 anniversary gun. Uh, but yeah, uh, Ruger already sort of had its foothold because they were doing castings for Caspian. Uh, Springfield range officer, that was just sort of uh, entry level competition gun. Uh, Remington came in with their R1, which again, that's essentially a Dassan pistol. Uh, folks like Taylor and Company, that's that's a Philippine rebrand. Uh, you now, Cylinder Slide and, and Turnbull manufacturing were, were kind of cooperating on, on their retro models. I'm not sure where they got their slides and frames from. Uh, Christensen Arms looks like they've gotten their stuff from Caspian and just you know, reworked it with their with their Gucci slide serrations. And, and you see a lot of that nowadays. I mean, basically people are trying to disguise the fact that they're, they're all getting their stuff from one source. And so to make their, their 1911 copy look, look different from someone else's on the shelf, you know, they have to add more holes to the slide, you know, do some weird front strap texture or some uh, you know, weird slide serrations, etc. So my last question for you, Daniel, before we wrap up and then I'll add, give weird a chance to ask anything. Um, where do you see the 1911 going from here? That's yeah, probably a pretty deep question. Yeah, the, the, the thing is, yeah, it's basically all we have nowadays are 1911 clones uh, and sort of Glock wannabes. And the way the Glock aftermarket industry is going, you're going to see a lot of the Glock copies. I mean, like straight out, you know, backwards compatible Glocks. But, you know, really all, all you can either do now is go for a Gucci look or really, really make a precise gun. And I think a lot of people, you know, they're either shopping on price point or, you know, this gun looks really cool. And to a lesser degree, some people appreciate craftsmanship. But yeah, the, the market is saturated. <laughs> and Really, I mean, it really is. You have so many different options from from low end to high end. Yeah. Weird. Do you have any questions uh, before we wrap up? Oh, I mean, there's just so much information there. Um, yeah, my eyes were kind of rolling towards the end of this list. <laughs> it was like, oh my god. I'm, I'm so gonna... listen to the show three or four times before <laughs> you write us, or at least read the show notes. <laughs> Yeah, there's a, there's a lot more in the show notes than than the, what we covered, as as usual, Daniel. <laughs> but uh, yeah, anything specifically weird you want to ask Daniel about? Um, no, I mean I think you covered it. I mean I just I think as far as your statement about where's the 1911 going, I mean I I don't think it's going anywhere. I, I don't I don't know if if the market can support the number of people out there making them. Uh, but the uh. But yeah, I mean, it's one of those, it's, it's like revolvers, you know, the revolvers started falling out of favor, like, you know, towards the end of the eighties and the early nineties, but there's still just as many revolvers as there were back then. 
So the 1911's not going anywhere. There's there's a reason why it's still around. Well, and you have the. I mean, it's kind of like the guitar world, to be honest with you. Like, you have the 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 custom quote unquote guitar makers who are making individual pieces on order for six or seven thousand dollars, or you have Fender making the same guitar for six hundred dollars. But it all depends on your preferences, your choices, the, the level of performance you want to specify from your instrument or from your firearm. Yep. And and, and the firearms industry is really, I mean, it's, it's a mature industry. So, like, I mean, I remember thinking back on the, oh, I wonder if there are, like, the, you know, the, the don't, don't make them like this anymore. And, and, I mean, and they don't make them like, you know, that anymore, like as far as like bluing goes and a lot of like the custom fitting and things like that, that was going on back then when labor was so much cheaper, but overall, you know, if you want a 45 ACP 1911, just like your grandfather, you know, carried in Europe, uh, that's, you know, you can get that. And meanwhile, if there's a gun, they're not making anymore is probably a good reason like there's a reason why you know there's we're talking about so many different 1911 manufacturers but y- there's only like what five of the savage 45s that was in the, yeah. the, the, the 1910 trial right and i had i handled one of them and actually my uh my friend he got handed it to me by uh he got handed to it by jim sapika of the uh of the nra museum and the first thing he did was he locked the slide back to 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 inspect the chamber like you do and he's like oh there's i i don't even understand exactly what's going on but evidently you're not supposed to do that like <laughs> you there's there's voodoo involved to get the slide closed again i, I don't know if it needs like live rounds or something or something like that to close the slide but either way he got yelled at <laughs> and 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 that's that's a crappy design Excellent. Well, I appreciate it. Um, like we said, there are there are so many more things to look at in the show notes that we have not covered. I mean, I, I got to the point where it's like, I don't want to list all the different names. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, be, sure, be sure to check them out. And also, be sure to join the Handgun Radio discussion group on Facebook. Because Daniel posts a lot of this stuff on there. And right. I will, I will respond. You know, I mean, yes. If you... and, and stuff like you posted the patent for that that Taurus has a patent for a, a two shot revolver, <laughs> of which I believe your, your your caption was "Go home, Taurus, you're drunk." <laughs> yeah. They're trying to do that bar pistol from Germany. Oh, is that what it was? Oh, uh, I don't. That yeah, really don't... flat one. Yeah. I just want to know what the trigger pulls like on that to flip a, a <laughs> cylinder 180 degrees uh, and it's, and being made in Brazil. No. <laughs> All right. Well, with that exhausting thought, we'll head into the wrap up section and close out the show. Don't forget to shop Brownells using our affiliate link, head to firearmsradio.tv and click the affiliate link in the upper right hand corner. Be sure to go like handgun radio on Facebook and share it with your friends and leave us a review on iTunes. Listen to all the great shows on the Firearms Radio Network, and be sure to check out the Firearms Radio Network on YouTube. And uh, Daniel, thank you so much for coming out, coming on the show. Where can people find you, and where can people read your articles? Well, again, nearly the majority of my articles are over at looserounds.com, or you can find me on Facebook. You certainly can find me at uh, 556 Timeline page over on Facebook, or at the Handgun Radio Discussion Group. Excellent, and we really appreciate you coming on the show. And uh, weird, thank you for being on the show this week. Did not it, expect you. It, it's it's good to be back. Like, oh man, it it was awesome to listen to the listen to the shows. Like, you know, I mean, I you were actually telling me about. I was talking about the theme song on my, you know, putting the theme on my show, and you were talking, about, oh, the theme song. I'm like, wait, this show's got a theme song. And then I was listening to the, <laughs> oh yeah, no, I know that theme song. <laughs> I. I hadn't heard it for years. It kind of sounds like a um, a version of uh, the the show with Red Fox. Oh yeah. What's that song? Sanford and Son. Yeah. But 
but yeah so uh so yeah it's good it's good to, good to finally be back and like it's, oh especially that 200th episode what an awesome group of guys you guys had on and yeah that was like, a good time literally i mean i i i wrote the bit that you played before that you know a, a week ahead of time so i had no idea what ryan had planned and so there was a little tongue in cheek of the oh i had to be on vacation and i'm like <laughs> I'm missing this for I'm missing this for Vegas. Screw this. <laughs> Craig gave me some serious hell. <laughs> yes, he did. <laughs> I deserve it. Oh well, I appreciate it. Uh, thank you so. And, and weird, uh, your new podcast. You should you should plug that. Yes, yes. You could you could find me at my blog, which is weirdworld.com, and you could also find uh, listen to me on the Assorted Calibers podcast. That's assortedcalibers.com or anywhere podcasts can be found. All right, and be sure to go check that out. So uh, thank you, Daniel, and thank you, Weird. Well, it's good to be on. Until next week, have fun and safe shooting.